Well, friends, a week and a half ago, I figured that this morning I'd be preaching on friendship, but I'm not going to be, because I'm standing here in an empty auditorium, and you're at home, and we are practicing social distancing in this unprecedented time for our church and for many people. A lot has changed, and you and I both know that, so we're not doing any corporate services at the church right now. Gospel communities have radically changed, and our leaders are working on some ways to keep you connected by using Google Hangouts and some other platforms that maybe digitally we could still stay connected together. Uh, There's many things changing, but I do want to take a moment before we jump in and to tell you what we'll be doing today, and I want to tell you what is not changing. Here's what's not changing. We are the church. We are salt and light. We are the children of God. We are the people of God who have the embodied presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives called to love God and to love others and to be a witness to the glory and beauty and wonder of Jesus Christ in this world. And as many of you know, we've been in 1 Peter. Peter starts his first epistle by reminding us that we're sojourners. We are elect exiles in a world that's not our own. And maybe a couple of weeks ago, for many of us, this just felt like a fine home for our souls. But we really feel it now, don't we? That this this world is not an eternal world for us. And so this is a wonderful time for us to slow down, to press into the Lord, and to see what he has for us in this season. So we're not going to be moving forward in friendship. We're going to be doing something else. Instead, for the For the next number of weeks, however many it is, we're going to be digging into dynamics of personal relationship with God. Because for this next season, this is going to be you leading you. You leading your family, you leading people around you. And so to that effort, let me start by asking you all a question. I want to ask you this. How is your personal relationship with God right now? Let's not move too quickly beyond that question, right? There's no time constraints. You're not in this room right now. We're not trying to get you out to lunch. Let's just slow down for a moment. Really, how is your relationship with God right now? Because I'm not going to be, you know, ordering you to stand up and to sing a song. You don't have to be to a GC right now. There's not something you have to lead, something you have to do. This is just you leading you. And so this allows us for a moment to really slow down and to ask that question, what does it look like in this season for each of us to go to the table of God's word, to meet the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to pick up a knife, to pick up a fork, and to cut into the solid food of relationship with the Lord. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do that. So we're scrapping friendship for now, and we're going this direction. Before I jump into our scripture, I want to tell you this as well. Uh, After this sermon piece, I've got like a five-minute bit for the kids, okay? So we're gonna, I'm going to lead them through something and give an activity for everyone to do. So you'll do the sermon, and then I'll give you a chance to push pause for a moment. We'll bring the kids over in case they're not watching this right now, and I'll lead something for the kids and give you all an activity to do this morning, okay? So that's going to be our layout for the day. All right, there is a common metaphor that shows up all throughout the New Testament. I want to share that with you so you can make sense of why we're moving this direction toward dynamics of personal relationship. One of the metaphors that Paul uses, that Peter uses, that all throughout the New Testament the apostles use is comparing the growth of a young infant to the growth of a young Christian. And the metaphor is just as a baby goes from drinking milk to eating solid food, being able to use their fingers to manipulate silverware, to feed themselves. Just as a child does that, the Bible says Christians go from drinking milk to eating solid food, which means they can use their own fingers, manipulate silverware, so to speak, to feed themselves. One of the places in the New Testament where Paul uses this metaphor is 1 Corinthians. Listen, here's what he writes. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not yet ready for it. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, gosh, there is so much I wanted to tell you. There's so much I want you to know and to experience in the Lord. You just weren't quite ready yet. I was was giving you milk, but I am praying and pushing toward the day in which you are eating solid food. 
Friends, I think this is a season for us to do that together, for us to walk in, in learning how to feed ourselves, to lead ourselves, to lead our families and people around us. God is doing something for every person in every family right now. There is nothing that passes through his sovereign plan that he is not doing for the glory of his, his son Jesus and the good of his church. And so how do we listen to hear what he's doing in our lives right now, right? So we're going to jump into dynamics of personal relationship, and here's the first dynamic we're going to look at today is holiness. All right, now maybe, as I just said that word, maybe you're thinking, holiness? That's kind of odd. If we're talking about relationship with God, why not reading my Bible or praying or maybe some attribute of God like his love or, or joy or something like that? Why holiness, Ryan? And here's why maybe you're thinking that. I think that word, depending on whether or not you grew up in the church, what denomination you grew up in, or your experience of people around you who have called themselves Christians, when you hear the word holiness, maybe it brings up all these images and ideas in your mind of, of what that looks like. So for example, I think for many people, they hear the word holiness and they think about a certain type of Christian. Right? Like there's, that there's some Christians that are really concerned about holiness. And maybe here's what you think about, that a Christian who's concerned about holiness is the kind of person who only listens to Christian radio, right? Maybe the Christian that really is concerned about holiness never watches a movie rated above PG or only ever wears formal wear on Sunday morning gatherings. I want to help you see this morning that that's a fundamental misunderstanding of holiness because this is something that belongs in the life of every Christian and it is essential for relationship with God. In fact, the writer of the book of Hebrews, he goes so far as to say that there's a direct connection between holiness in our lives and relationship with God. Here's what he writes in the, in the letter of the Hebrews. Pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Did you hear what he said? Pursue holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Holiness, you see, it's this is not like some external thing. It's not like a list of do's and don'ts. Holiness is the power of God's Spirit coming into our life through our faith with Jesus, our faith in Jesus. And God's Holy Spirit begins this inner transformation that begins to work its way out into real character change. It, it's an inner transformation that begins to change how we live. That's what holiness is, which means it belongs in the life of every Christian. And what the Bible says is, without this, without this inner transformation of holiness working in your life, no one will see the Lord. So this is crucial for relationship with him. Before we jump into our passage, one last thing I want to say to help kind of ground our time and give you something to think about here. I think for many of us, when we think of the word holiness, we imagine kind of a religious -y, obscure word that feels like a wall between us and God. That holiness feels like this list of external things I have to do, this, this measure I have to meet up to, this wall I have to get over to get to the Lord. I want to show you that holiness is not like a wall. It's like an avenue that takes us to relationship with God. It's not a wall. It's an avenue to him. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 together, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read that. We'll walk that together, and we're going to see how holiness is critical for dynamics of personal relationship with God in this season and in every season. All right, here's what the Word of God says, friends. Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instructions from us on how you should live and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is God's will, your sanctification. That you keep away from sexual immorality. That each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. Because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses. As we also previously told and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. 
So obviously this passage is about holiness. What did verse 7 say? It said, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. So let's walk through this. I want to help you see and understand that if we want to grow in deep personal relationship with the Lord in this season, how do we see holiness not as a wall, but an avenue, something we need to see the Lord, okay? And, and to make you hunger for this a little bit here, how many of you personally, or there's people you know, who would say, man, I, I want to experience God like the psalmists do. I want God to be a refuge for me, a shelter for me. Last night, I was in Psalm 18, in which David talks about God being his, his refuge, his rock, his strong tower, his fortress, the lover of his soul. How many of us want God to be like that shepherd in Psalm 23 who leads us to still waters, who lets us lie down in green pastures, who walks with us in the valley, whose rod and staff comforts us? Friends, if, if we want that kind of relationship, that kind of intimacy, we need holiness. So, just to help you hunger for that. Now, how do you know holiness is working in your life? How do you know it's there? Verse 1 tells us, Brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God as you are doing, do this even more. Here's how you know if God's Holy Spirit is driving your life. Here's how you know if the power of holiness is operating in you. Can you find in yourself a desire to please God through obedience to him? See, Paul says, Paul says, brothers and sisters, continue to live in a way, live in a way to please God. He says, as you are doing, do this even more. There are seasons in which this may be hard to find in your life, but can you find a spark? Can you find a just a, a smoldering wick? Can you find a part in your life that says, God, I I want to please you through my obedience to you. That is how you know if holiness is operating in your life. That's what verse 1 lays out for us. Now, we jump to verse 3. Paul says, for this is God's will, your sanctification. Now, this word sanctification is kind of a big word, though you shouldn't be intimidated by it. Let me explain it to you in a way that's really going to help you here. Theologians have broken up the Christian life into three major phases, okay? So justification, sanctification, and glorification. Let's talk about these, these uh, two outer ones, and then we'll talk about sanctification. Justification is the good news of the gospel. It means that at the moment you repent of sin and turn to Jesus in faith, you are justified by Jesus Christ. Paul, in Romans, talks about Abraham. He says that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So justification is that moment in which God invites you into the family. Please hear this. In this season right now, soak this up to help you walk in relationship with the Lord. Christianity is not, it is not you fighting for holiness on your own and trying really hard so that God may invite you into his family. That is not Christianity. That's other religions in the world. That is not Christian faith. Here's Christianity. We are orphans, broken by sin, and God sends his son Jesus to leave the 99 to pursue the one, to, to run after the prodigal son, to care for us. Jesus comes, he takes us as orphans, and he adopts us into the family of God. We become children, and then we learn how to live like children, right? That's Christianity. So justification is the moment at which you become right with God. It's not a process. It's not a long journey. It's not figuring out how to do enough good works. Justification is just a moment, a brief moment in time, when through faith in Jesus and turning from sin, you're adopted. You're a son. You're a daughter. You are brought into the household, and then now you start learning how to live that way. Now, glorification's this other end. This is life with Jesus. And I don't mean life with Jesus like quiet times and time of the word. I mean literally seeing Jesus face to face, being in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's glorification. It's being in heaven. That happens when we die or Jesus returns. So this word in the middle where Paul says, for this is God's will, your sanctification. This thing in the middle, sanctification is everything between being justified, invited, adopted into the family, and dying or Jesus returning. Everything in between is sanctification. 
And this word sanctification is beautiful. It's hard to really capture what's in the Bible here from the Greek, but here's what it is. Sanctification marries the idea of ethics and identity in one word. So when it says God's will for your life is your sanctification, it's not just a word of ethics. In other words, it's not just do this and don't do this and live this way and don't live this way. It actually brings together ethics and identity and says, listen, brothers and sisters, live this way not only because of who you are, but because of whose you are. Ethics and identity. This is God's will, your sanctification. We're living in a new way between being justified and being glorified because of not only who we are, but whose we are in Christ. Okay, and also, uh, speaking of holiness, this is really helpful. Maybe some of you right now are asking some, some really good questions like, what is God's will for me right now? What, what is God's will for this season of life? I think in a lot of ways, we tend to think of God's will in sort of a transactional one-time decision fork in the road thing, right? Like, is it God's will to go to this college or that college, to take this job or that job, to live in this house or that house? And I don't want to say that God doesn't have a will for you in those things. But this is so helpful, isn't it? This is so helpful in verse 3. Paul says, for this is God's will. What? What's God's will? Your sanctification. In every season of life, do you know what the, the deepest thing that God's will is about in your life? Not what you're doing, but who you're becoming. Not what you're doing. Who are you becoming? How are you living? How are you growing as a result of understanding who you are and whose you are? Right, That's God's will for our life right now. So we move on in our passage. Now, Paul has a very specific application for sanctification for these Thessalonian believers. And we'll read what that is. And I think for some of you, friends, this is maybe a word that's gonna be really timely for some of you that you need to hear right now. Maybe for others of you, it's something else and you'll need the spirit to lead you in that. But let's pick up in verse four. That each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. Thessalonica was a Greek city. And in Greek culture, they had a tendency to separate body from soul, the physical from the spiritual. And there was this tendency to believe that essentially you could do what you want with your body and it won't affect your soul, right? That that you can just kind of do your own thing and you can separate the physical realm from the spiritual realm. But Paul comes in and says, no, 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 no. That's not how that works. You've been made by a God to be relational, spiritual, physical, emotional, all together. And so Paul says to them, friends, listen, whatever you do with your body, you're not checking your soul at the door. Now, some of you maybe need to hear this right now because social distancing doesn't mean spiritual isolation right now. You hear that? Social distance doesn't mean spiritual isolation. We gotta stay connected to the community in some way and certainly meeting the Father, Son, and Spirit at the table of his word because maybe right now a lot of you might be tempted in this season of being pulled away from other obligations, maybe a lot more time at home to try to find some sense of pleasure or peace in something that is not good. Pornography or something else of that vein. I want to encourage you, maybe that's a word that you need right now in this season. For others of you, maybe that's not exactly what you need to hear right now, but the Spirit's telling you something right now, right? God's will in your life is what? Your sanctification, not just what you're doing. Who are you becoming? How are you living right now based on who you are and whose you are? That's God's will in your life. So what's that look like right now? Seek the Spirit in that. Lead yourself in this season. Lead others around you to make sense of that. Here's something Paul also says. He says this, uh, to not walk in lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. Now, I want to make sure you hear that correctly. Here is not what Paul is saying. He's not saying, hey, be those good Christian people, not like those dirty Gentiles who don't know God. It's not that. This is not like an us and them statement. Paul's not putting up a wall and saying, look how great we are. Look how broken they are. Man, Paul would never say that. Because if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, you know what Paul says? He calls himself the chief of sinners. The chief of sinners. 
All throughout Paul's ministry, friends, Paul was constantly blown away by the idea that God's grace would come into my life. Paul said, I I can't believe, I, I used to imprison Christians and approve of the stoning of Christians, and Jesus Christ pursued me. He left the 99 and he found me. So when Paul says, Gentiles who don't know God, man, he's not beating up on people. Here's what he's saying. He's making a very matter-of-fact statement. Here's what it is. If you're being driven by anything more deeply than pleasing God through your obedience, that is not a good sign that you know him. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying a desire for holiness in your life. I'm not talking external stuff like we talked about earlier. I'm not talking about never watching a movie above PG or only listening to K-Love Christian radio, right? By holiness, I mean the inner transformation of God's Holy Spirit driving you, working its way out into real character change in which you think more deeply about not just what you're doing, but who you're becoming. So, when Paul says, Gentiles who don't know God, there's compassion there and a sober reminder for us that a sign of knowing God, a sign of his holiness working in our life is a desire to please him with our obedience. All right, moving on in this passage. Verse six, this means that one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses as we also previously told and warned you. Maybe that word jams you up. So just give me a couple minutes to dig into this because I don't want you to move past that and think, man, I don't, I don't like that image of God. Paul says that God is an avenger of these offenses. Maybe the idea of God being an avenger it just sort of doesn't sit well with you, right? Like maybe you think of modern movie culture like God is Hulk, you know, just throw, throwing someone around. Or God is Thor shooting lightning bolts at someone, right? This idea of God as avenger is this. Um, God is love. John says that in his first epistle. Paul would completely affirm that. But brothers and sisters, we cannot, with intellectual honesty, with real integrity, we cannot say and believe God is love and not also recognize God is completely committed to justice and righteousness and truth through and through. There is not a shade of darkness in our Father. And so for him to be fully love, right, it's good for us to remember, love didn't exist first, and then God shows up and says, hey, I like this idea of love. God exists before all, and love, the, the very fountainhead of love is our Father. It flows from him. Because this is true, here's what Paul is simply saying. Because God is love, and you've been called to live in holiness, we've been called to have sanctification working in our life. If we neglect that, and walk in ways in which we don't care about righteousness in our life, care about injustice, care about walking in truth, Paul's just reminding us with a gentle but firm warning, God is an avenger. He cares about righteousness and justice. And friends, this is why we need Jesus. This is why we need the gospel. Are you carrying your sin or is the Savior carrying your sin? Right now, especially, it's pretty easy to point fingers at something, at someone, about where unrighteousness is or where injustice is. Brothers and sisters, if you're not seeing that in your own soul, you're not looking hard enough. There is unrighteousness and injustice in you and me. And God is an avenger of all these things. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need the gospel right now. So just to help you with that, I don't want us to be people who would stand on the idea of God as love and somehow think that we can say God is fully love and pretend like that doesn't mean that he doesn't care deeply about righteousness and holiness and truth and justice, right? All right, now final verse. This is verse eight. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Right now as you're listening, if there's a piece of you, right, that's hearing this and thinking, "Ah, I don't know. You know, this, this whole idea of having to run after God and holiness and, and like deny myself and really listen to the Spirit to find out what he's saying to me and to think deeply about just not what I'm doing but, you know, who I'm becoming and all this. I, I just don't know if I, if I really want that or if that makes sense for me. Friends, I just want to encourage you 
When Paul wrote those words we just read, he was saying, listen, when we reject the fact that our Father is calling us to grow in holiness so we can be in relationship with him, you're not rejecting a religion. You're not rejecting some teacher. You're not rejecting me. You're not rejecting some denomination. Friends, when we reject the call to holiness, we are rejecting God himself. In other words, hear this. If we're not moving toward holiness, we're actually moving away from relationship with God. And this is what I meant earlier, that holiness is not a wall that blocks us from God. It's an avenue that takes us to him. As a simple metaphor, suppose I went to my wife and I said, hey, honey, I, I want more emotional intimacy with you. I want to have some great time with you. I, I want to know you more. I want to know your heart more. I want to experience deeper connection with you. But at the same time, I kind of want to sleep around and maybe have like an open marriage and just give myself to other people. And, and so basically, I want to have all this intimacy without any of the exclusivity, right? I, I want to have all this intimacy without any of the commitment. You see, in doing that, I may be saying out of one side of my mouth, honey, I want deeper relationship with you, but out of the other side, I'm rejecting that relationship, right? That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, if you want to experience God like the psalmist talk about, hiding under the shadow of his wings, that he's your refuge, that he's your stronghold, that he's your rock, that he is your good shepherd, that he's the lover of your soul. If you want that, you crave that, but at the same time, you're saying, I don't really want to think about holiness or having to dig into knowing God and his word or having a deeper prayer life or thinking critically about who I'm becoming and not only who I am, but whose I am. If we're not thinking in that space, we're actually saying in one side of our mouth, I want relationship. And over here is saying, I reject relationship. That's what Paul means. Consequently, if we reject these things, we're not rejecting man. We are rejecting God. So, brothers and sisters, I am excited to walk with you in this season to process what does it look like to have a dynamic, personal relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I really want to help you lead yourselves well and lead those around you well in this season. And maybe, maybe for some of us, we're going to come to find out, receive a, a mercy from God to see, man, Lord, I've been, I have been too dependent on milk being brought to me by others. And Father, I want some help in this season to pick up the knife and to pick up the fork and to eat at the table with you, Lord. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for the church in this season. So each week, we'll walk through a different dynamic of personal relationship. And throughout the week, we'll be producing a little bit of content to help us think critically about that together. And to talk about that in gospel communities, if maybe you all decide to use Google Hangouts or some other format that you can digitally connect. All right, now listen, I'm gonna pray, and then I'll lead us to pause, for you to pause the video to bring the kids over for the peace for them. So brothers and sisters, pray with me. Father God, we're living in a really weird time right now. And, Lord, we're seeing in the news and we're seeing in people around us and we're seeing on social media that there are a lot of people who have a lot of things to say, a lot of people who feel like maybe they're experts in this or that. And, God, it's good for us to stay connected. But, God, I pray that we would not look back to this time and the fruit that we would see borne out in our lives is just Netflix series. That the fruit that we'd see borne out would not just be constantly connected to the social anxiety of, of social media, constantly connected to the next news article. God, could we look back on this season and see the fruit of saying, Lord, in this time in my life, I experienced you. I felt what it was like to be under the shadow of your wings, that you'd be my refuge, my stronghold, my rock, and the lover of my soul. God, could we look back and say, God, I met you at the table. You invited me to the table. Just you and me, Father. Just you and me. You invited me. You laid out a meal in your word. And in prayer, I met you and we picked up the silverware. And God, I, I experienced you. God, would you please make that the fruit of this season for each one of us? God, would you comfort and, com and give compassion to us, God, for those of us in the medical field or other industries that are really busy right now?
that are spending a lot less time away from home. God, would you comfort and help and strengthen? And would you give us eyes and ears, Father, to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus to serve others? God, would you move us more and more to experience the inner transformation of your Holy Spirit in our life, working its way out into real character change, and that we would be thinking about who we're becoming, not just what we're doing, because of not only who we are, but whose we are. God, call us into deeper relationship with you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, friends. Now, I'm going to try to turn the uh, energy level up to double what it currently is to, uh, to really cap the attention of your kiddos. And so at this point, if you want to, you can hit pause on your video, bring the kids over here, just five to seven minutes with them, and then an activity for everyone to do. Okay, so hit pause, bring them over. All right, guys. Pastor Ryan here. If you are younger than 15 years old, I want you to raise your hand right now. Hey, I can see you. I can see you. Mom and dad might say otherwise. I can see you. Hands up. Hands up. Okay, now that I have your attention, we're going to do a question and answer together from a really cool book called The New City Catechism. And here's what this is, guys. This is a way for us to know God more and to experience his love in our life. We're going to do one question and one answer and then we're going to talk about it next week. So listen, listen clearly. If you can write, you need to get a piece of paper in front of you and a pen or pencil in your hand. If you can't write, you need to give it to mom or dad. And let me, let me really pump you up about something right now, okay? Now listen, here, you and I both know this is true. Basically all the time you have to listen to mom and dad, right? They call all the shots. What's up with that? Right? Now that's a good thing. Because God says that we should obey and honor our father and mother. So you should listen to mom and dad. But listen, Pastor Ryan right now is giving you permission that you get to lead this part, right? It's all you. And if mom and dad don't listen, you come talk to me, all right? We'll have a conversation with them and work it out. But right now, this is all you. You get to lead this. You get to lead this part and to lead the activity that you'll all be doing together. So if you can write, get a piece of paper in front of you and a pen. If you can't write, give it to mom and dad, and you're gonna write down this question. Are you ready? I'll say it twice so you can hear it. Here's the question. What is our only hope in life and death. Write that down. Let me say it again to you. What is our only hope in life and death? Okay, now here's the answer. So right underneath that question where you've written it, where mom and dad have written it, you're going to write this answer underneath. And here's what the answer is. That we are not our own, but belong to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ. Let me say it again. That we are not our own, but belong to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, now listen, you've got that question and answer now, and we're going to talk about it next week, so try to put it to memory. Read that throughout the week. Maybe have mom or dad help you put that into your mind, but here's the activity that you get to lead now. I want everyone in your family to list five things that you love that are in your life. Five things. Now listen, here's some examples. It could be someone in your family or a family pet or something you own or a fun experience or a, a vacation memory, right? Or just anything. What, what are five things that you really love that are in your life? Now everyone in your family has to do this, right? Even mom and dad and you get to lead this out. If uh, maybe you have a younger brother or sister who can't write quite yet, but they can talk, maybe write down for them or have mom and dad do that. And here's what you're going to do. Once you have all five of those, you're going to go around your family and everyone is going to share their five things that they love. And then you're going to pray together. And we're going to thank God that we have hope because we belong to him and to Jesus Christ. That all these things that we love, do you know where they come from? They don't come from us. They come from God. That God gives us these things we love. 
and that we have hope no matter what happens. No matter what happens in life, we have hope because we belong to God and to Jesus. Okay, so there you go. You get to lead this now. You get to run this exercise, and all of you share the things you love and pray together, and we'll have something else for you next week. All right, let's pray to finish our time. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your love in our life. We thank you for how you care for us. God, we thank you for our families and all the blessings we have. And God, we especially thank you that we have hope no matter what happens in our lives because we belong to God and to his son, Jesus Christ, who saves us from our sin by his perfect life, by his death on the cross, and by his resurrection from the dead. Lord God, help us believe in him with everything in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, friends, we'll see you next time.